This episode of Destructoid is brought to you by Netflix. Coming up on Destructoid, Skyrim's second DLC dropped yesterday and it is full of half-naked orphans, seriously. Two Final Fantasy 13s weren't enough, so Square Enix announced a third and somehow we survived PAX this year. And oh look, it's gonna be a four-day event next year. Great, wonderful, fantastic. All this and more right now on Destructoid. Welcome to Destructoid, I'm Tara Long. <clears throat> and I'm Max Scoville. And we survived PAX! Uh, speak for yourself. Also, we happy Wednesday, but mostly we survived PAX. I don't even know what day of the week it is. Barely. You know? We're just... both kind of disgustingly yeah. sick right now. Was... But hey, PAX was fun. PAX was great. It was, it was good a... to see people. We saw all our friends. We saw we saw Ben and Gobin and Eric and, and Richard and Becky and Crabtree and Garamont and You're just making I'm making up names now. at this point. Yeah, we met a lot of you. So uh, many thanks to the fans who came up and introduced themselves and said hello, came to all the parties and everything. Uh, if you weren't able to make it to PAX Prime this year because you couldn't get off work or you didn't have the money or you lived too, too far away, there's good news and there's bad news. Or good news and good news, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the first good news is that PAX is coming to Australia next year, which brings me one step closer to my life's dream of hugging a baby koala. Do you see the picture? It's really cute. Yes. Oh, look at the picture! That's what it would look like if it hugged me! Aww. Oh god, it's so good. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, the bad news is, or good news, depending, uh, PAX Prime is going to be four days next year, which means that I probably won't survive to hug a baby koala. So thanks for ruining PAX for me, PAX. I would Real be, cool. I would be all about PAX Australia. I know we have a oh, lot of PAX Australian Australia fans. PAX Australia sounds awesome. I just don't want PAX Prime to take up an entire Labor Day weekend for me, because then there's no downtime afterwards. You have to go straight back to work. Yeah, Which that's sucks. true. Anyway, we still have a fun job. That's the thing to keep in mind. Um, Something that happened yesterday is the, the latest Skyrim DLC got released, which is Hearthfire, which is sort of not that exciting because it's like The Sims meets Minecraft. It's uh, romantic. You get to, you know, you get to build a house in Tamriel and then fill it with little children and they run around. It's all very lovely. Uh, we're going to put up a proper standalone video review sometime soon, but I figured I would give you a few brief impressions of my time with it yesterday. Uh, when you install it, you're supposed to be approached uh, in town by a courier who tells you that there's land for sale from the Jarl of Falkreath. Uh, I think you can also buy it for a land in the Pale or in Halmar. I didn't get either of these. Instead, I got a courier who brought me a letter from the orphanage in Riften saying I should adopt one of Skyrim's many orphans because they're just orphans just everywhere, just all over the orphan place. Orphan farms. After this happened, an orphan actually ran by in her underwear, which I really, really hope was a glitch. And I went to the orphanage, uh, and there were just orphans running around in their underwear. And I didn't, I didn't get any footage, but I do have a screen cap I took with my phone. They're just half-naked orphans everywhere, and I legitimately do not know if this is like, you're supposed to adopt them and put clothes on them, or if just something really wrong is happening with my game, but it made me so uncomfortable. Um, anyway, since I wasn't a homeowner, I was told I should probably build a house before adopting, which is fine, except since I got the letter from the orphanage first, I didn't know where to go buy land, so I had to Google it. There are lots of land for sale from the stewards of, I believe, Falkreath, Morthal, and Dawnstar for 5,000 gold each. You go there, and there's like a carpenter's workbench and a drafting table and then a chest with all the stuff you need to build the actual uh, the first building and then there's like uh, like a, a what do you call it, a hammer and anvil thing. And it's basically just a more advanced crafting system. Uh, it's not like you go and physically set out the pieces of the house. You just kind of build one one piece at a time. So like the foundation, the frame, the walls, the roof. Uh, and then from there, you, you can build stuff inside the house, like uh, like a bed or, you know, like a like a shelf. It's like a little kind of Skyrim uh, yeah, Ikea yeah, setup. Yeah, sure. uh, you can also put in like a garden or a stable. It's, it's kind of neat, but really it's, from my experience so far has been janky. And frankly, honestly, if, if you're interested, it's 400 Microsoft points. It's on Xbox Live right now. So just, you know, go check it out. Go make a house. Go get some half-naked orphans mm -hmm. to play with, whatever. Uh, I'll okay. try and, you know, get the full full report. But, uh, you know, roll the dice. You could buy a house before in Skyrim, right? And yes. Now you can actually kind of but outfit can, it with the things that you want. This is much more, much more simsy. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pick what, what goes in there. Sounds interesting. I don't know if that will be the thing that gets me back into Skyrim, but... I'm sure some people will dig it. Uh, moving on, if you're one of those people, much like myself, who still longs for the days of not having to create a login or steal your neighbor's internet just to play a damn game, then I've got news. EA does not care about you. Oh. Nope, not one bit. Uh, let me explain. Frank Jibbo, is it a soft G or a hard? I don't know. We'll go with soft. 
Frank Jabot is the president of EA Labels, and he's scheduled to speak at the annual Cloud Gaming USA conference that's happening in San Francisco next week. Uh, he's speaking regarding EA's efforts to advance online gaming, which is, you know, um, whatever. Naturally, the people organizing the conference have released a brochure highlighting the qualifications and accomplishments of each of its speakers. And here is what Jabot's biography had to say. Quote, we are very proud of the way EA evolved with consumers. I have not greenlit one game to be developed as a single player experience. Today, all of our games include online applications and digital services that make them live 24 seven 365. Because if there's one thing people want, it's to be online constantly. Wait a second, that doesn't sound right. I don't know. He later boasted that free to play games have been, been one of EA's biggest growth opportunities after which he stroked his mustache and then dove headfirst into an Olympic-sized liquid gold swimming pool. Because video games, that's what the internet and video games means. You get a swimming pool made of solid gold. Yeah, it, it occurred to me that maybe there's a reason that like, EA's games lately, I just kind of look at them and I'm like, eh, they're, yeah. all, they're all kind of sharing like mechanics a little bit and they all have like tacked on online stuff and I'm just like, well, I don't know. I can't remember the last EA game that I played where I really, really liked the multiplayer part of it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe anyway. there's more to come. Well, video games, it's yeah. a business. Uh, speaking of business, we all know the ironically titled Final Fantasy is one of the most prolific video game franchises in history, and I don't think anyone's actually expecting the final Final Fantasy. Uh, so in the meantime, Final Fantasy 13 2 was only released last February, uh, but there have already, or January, but there have already been rumors flying around that uh, 13 3 would be hot on its trail, and last week Square Enix made the official announcement that the next installment would be coming next year, titled Lightning Returns Final Fantasy 13. They mixed it up a little bit. Huh. They put the, the thing that normally goes after the colon before the colon. Oh, no, I don't know, confused. it's a stupid name. Um, so just last night, we got a bunch of news about the game. It sounds like quite a departure from usual Final Fantasy. For starters, Lightning, the uh, the female heroine with the pink hair, who's very cute, voiced by Allie Hillis. Oh, I love Allie Hillis. She's flying solo, as in without a party. Uh, on top of that, she's gonna be able to move around freely during combat, and attacks will be mapped to different buttons. There's gonna be an ATB gauge, and apparently the gameplay is close to action. Well, it really doesn't sound much like a turn-based RPG, so this, this might ruffle some feathers, but who knows? The world will also play a big role in the game, and it's, uh, it's set in an area called Navis Partis, and you play against a constantly running clock. Uh, two hours in real time will equal one uh, in-game day, and actions you take in the game will affect how much time you have left in this mysterious countdown, presumably leading to, uh, you know, bad things or terror. Destruction, etc. Yeah, like a big explosion. I don't know. Uh, and not to go full spoiler alert, but they've already said that the game is going to have a single ending, which is said to be a happy ending. Yay! Uh, now this announcement, you know, might be a tad premature since according to Square, the game is only 30% finished, but, you know, considering how much of a departure this sounds like for the typical Final Fantasy game, is this good? Is this bad? Do we? Do people want to change things? I don't know. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments. I'm actually, I've, it's been kind of a weird, it's been a weird Final Fantasy a couple of weeks in my house. Uh, Jen's been playing uh, Theatrhythm, the, uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Chocobo dancing game or whatever, and I've been playing Final Fantasy VII on my Vita, which um, I forgot I was really excited about when that first oh, came out. Yeah. yeah. We're having a big old weeaboo yeah, festival seriously, up in this bitch. Yeah, seriously, invite me to your weeaboo party, please. Yeah. So I can crap everywhere. So last Thursday, Steam, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Last Thursday, Steam gave the green light, pause for cringe, on their green light program, and uh, already the internet is mad. Would you believe it? I wouldn't. Uh, for those not in the know, the green light program was in, uh, announced back in July as a way of letting the Steam community vote on what new games get approved for the platform. On the, under, uh, on the other end of things, any game developer or publisher can post videos, screenshots, and a description of their game, as long as it does not violate the Steam terms of service. So it's kind of like Steam Workshop, except instead of mods, it's full games. And instead of worthwhile content, it's a bag of crap. Not everything, of course, is a bag of crap. Uh, for example, Woodcutter Simulator 2012 provides a thrilling challenge and also, there's a part in the trailer where it looks like two trucks are doing it. Hey, I got wood. Really funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, some of the games are good, but most of them are crap. So to weed out all the bad ones, Valve has implemented a $100 fee effective from here on out to anyone wanting to submit their game to Greenlight. All the proceeds go to Child's Play Charity, so sick kids get video games, Valve doesn't really profit from it, 
And in turn, we, the consumers, don't have to sift through dozens of 9-11 simulators and hilarious Half-Life 3 jokes. God, you guys not would, would not believe how funny those are after the 20th Cause it, time. Because it's funny because the game hasn't come out yeah. yet. Yeah, that's, that's the reason it's funny. Um, also, the Android market is open, as you all know, and it kind of sucks. Like, curation is not a bad thing. Or is it, say some people on the internet, specifically people who feel $100 is too much to ask of indie developers who often struggle just to eat and pay rent. And while I do not deny that those people exist, I also believe that introducing a nominal fee barrier will ultimately refocus the attention back on the games that truly deserve it and away from the ones like this. Uh, yeah. That looks like a great game. It's hard to read the text, but you should because it's really enlightening. What do you do? Do you do you like play this game and then jerk off while you're playing it? It's like comics, but you jerk off while you're playing it, oh, and then there's patterns. Oh! I want this yeah, game! Yeah. What is this? Green yeah, light it. That's a shoe in for $100, game of I would pay $200 for that game. Yeah. I wasn't listening to the story. You I just would told. pay $1,000 to never have to see that to see that again. Um, but what do you guys think? I don't know. Max and I talked about this earlier before the show. We, we had some different opinions. It. We did argue about it. He thinks $100 is a lot to ask, and I don't think it's all that much. That's because you're rich. You're so I'm rich. I'm not rich. Look at I've you with those incredibly fancy poor in cardigans and glasses and, and, even and hair. Even when I was incredibly poor, I always was able to scrounge up $100 for something that really meant something to me and was super Well, I, I think that having having a, a, a payment system in place to try and keep people who are just straight trolling from just dumping their garbage on Greenlight is a good idea, but I think you could make it 20 bucks, you could make it five bucks, you could make it even 50 bucks is is half of 100 bucks. Yeah. You know math, that's true. I do know There's math, no argument but at with the same true time, math. how are you gonna side a threshold there? I mean, for instance, the entry to the IGF awards is $100. If you wanna make a game for the iOS store, the App Store, it's $100. If you wanna make one for Xbox Live Indie Games, it's $100. It's all like that, and there are minor differences between some of them. Of course, if you submit a game to the uh, ah. iOS store, it's probably going to get approved, whereas this, you pay $100 and you have no idea if your game is going to get chosen. But the same goes for the IGF. So there's a lot of different sides of this argument, um, and a lot of developers have mixed views on it. So I don't know. I'm curious, what what, what do you guys think? Is Make a Kickstarter to fund your That's what your it's coming line. to. That's almost what it's coming to now, because a lot of developers are saying, hey, if, if $100 is too much, Send me an idea for your game, and if it's if it's good, and I think it'll do successfully, hey man, I'll fund it. Just shove a five dollar bill into your floppy drive, and yeah. it'll work. And speaking of money, let's just take a word from our sponsors. Let's do that, guys. Video games are great and everything, but sometimes you need a break from video games, and that's why Jesus invented Netflix. It streams your favorite TV episodes and movies straight to your home, saving you time, money, and unnecessary frustration, which we all experience. With Netflix, you can instantly watch unlimited shows and movies on your PC or Mac, or right on your television if you've got a PS3, Xbox 360, or a Nintendo Wii console. For a limited time, all Destructoid viewers can get their own free trial membership. Just head over to netflix.com slash destructoid and sign up. And for you people overseas, in the UK and Ireland, we've not forgotten about you. You can get the same trial as in the US. Just head over to netflix.co.uk slash destructoid if you're in the UK and netflix.ie slash destructoid for you Irish folk. We like movies, right? I love the movies. Sometimes they even have movies about video games. That's true. Mm -hmm. Why would you watch those? No. So anyway, um, PAX was last weekend, as we mentioned, uh, in case you joined us after just weeks of not watching and you missed the beginning of the show and you just woke up and you're wearing like a funny pointy sleeping hat and a nightgown and you've got a long rib Van Winkle beard. Okay. Who knows? Um, but we put up a ton of videos, both on this channel and on youtube.com slash rev3games. What videos um, did you make at PAX this weekend, well, Tara, thank you for asking. I have a list right in front of me on this thing I'm reading off of. Uh, I did one about Far Cry 3 where I asked the lead designer about why there are turtles and can I have the game, please? I asked the hard-hitting questions. Yes. You can count on me really? for your journalism. Uh, I talked to Michael Wilford from Twisted Pixel about LocoCycle, which is uh, their new game. Those are the guys who did Miss Explosion Man, The Gunstringer, and The Maw. And, uh, he answered my questions and then showed me a motorcycle he built. Uh, then of course I had a weird little panic attack and I talked about Metal Gear Ground Zeroes after seeing the presentation uh, Hideo Kojima put on. Uh, please watch that video and tell me exactly how obnoxious and teenagery my voice sounds because my voice was cracking the whole time because I had a very bad cold. And also Anthony and I got to try on the Oculus Rift VR headset. Oh, I'm so jealous. Look at how cool I look. For the record, that is a very early prototype. It is literally cobbled together from uh, gaffer tape and hot glue and part of a ski mask. 
Um, should wear that to a bar to pick up chicks. More like to pick up items in Doom 3, the BFG edition. Seriously, I was oh, playing right, it on that. It was awesome. Okay. We had so it's so cool. Go just go watch those videos. Yeah, I'm gonna we saw see some that neat soon. things. What did you see, Tara? Yeah, Tell us about um, your things. Well, I interviewed the producer of Borderlands 2. We talked about the Mecromancer class, the girlfriend tree, all sorts of good gossipy things. Um, and according to Gearbox, the Mecromancer class should be out by October 16th, so earlier than expected. You can find that interview here on our Detroit channel, as well as a hands-on impressions video of my time with Project P100, which was one of the, I think, more unique games at PAX this year, the Wii U games, rather. Um, it's kind of like a mix between Pikmin with the art style of Beautiful, Show, Beautiful Joe with kind of the action mechanics of Bayonetta. Um, and it's done by the, guy, the guys at Platinum Games, so they've got some experience with those games. Uh, also, we have day one and day two PAX recap videos also up on this channel, so if you have not watched them yet, please go oh, watch go them, watch please. Them. We and them. last but not least, I just, like 10 minutes ago, put up a Tomb Raider impressions video. That's over on our Rev3 Games channel. There's plenty more videos to come. We have not edited them all. There's more editing to do. Yep. So make sure you're subscribed here hey. and to Rev3 Games. Hey Tara, want to see my Tomb Raider impressions? Ah, I'm going to craft! Ow! Oh no, I fell off a mountain! Wait, did you play the demo too? No, I was just... We should probably go. Oh, like, okay. You know. Um, on that note, that is all the time we have for today's show. We're going to be back here on Friday for another live show. We do those every Friday. But there's going to be a special guest in the house with us this time, and I won't tell you who it is. It's but your mom. It's my mom. My mom is coming on the show again. If you say anything to her, so we're not. Help we're me not God. kidding. Tara's mom is probably going to be the show. Yeah. Uh, that is happening this Friday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, right here on YouTube.com slash Detoid, and it will be just a bunch of embarrassment and messiness and terrible oh, things. Oh, it'll be wonderful. Yep. I'm going to lock her in the bathroom before the show, so. <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, Paul Helquist, who is the creative director of Borderlands 2, he is going to be visiting us in the studio tomorrow. He and Anthony and myself are going to be filming some playthroughs of each of the four character skill trees from Borderlands 2. I'm also going to be interviewing him after that, so if you have any burning questions for him, let us know, either in the comments below or you can tweet them directly to our at Show Twitter account. 